I hope you will join us today as we study the day of Pentecost. Luke wrote the book of Acts. Luke, the beloved physician. He also wrote the gospel according to Luke. In the last verses of Luke 24 and Acts chapter 1, there's some overlap. Now, after Jesus rose from the dead on Easter Sunday, on Resurrection Sunday, there was a 40-day period when he was on the earth, evidently between heaven and earth, ascending and descending from ascending into heaven and descending back to earth and ministering and making appearances to his disciples. And he had instructed them during this 40-year period to wait in the city of Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. He told them that they would receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost had come upon them and they would be witnesses unto him, unto Jesus, both in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Then the 40th day, after Easter, he ascended back into heaven to stay. Now there's a 10-day period where they're gathered in the upper room to pray. Where was the upper room? We're really not told. Perhaps there was an upper room in the temple that could be reserved for religious gatherings, religious meetings such as this, for prayer meetings, for study of the Torah, whatever. I, I, I don't know. I'm just speculating. And But the 120 gathered to, in obedience to the instruction of Jesus. Meanwhile, of course, the apostles had chosen a successor to Judas, who betrayed Jesus by lot. They chose Matthias. So Matthias was now one of the 12. And um, they're there, and you know, who all was there? We learned that yesterday, uh, the disciples, and of course, uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there, and uh, his brothers, and so it was quite a notable gathering of laborers, 120. Of course, that's not too many. Only 120 are in the upper room. <laughs> when Jesus preached to and ministered to multitudes of people and healed countless people, we're told by Peter in Acts 10, verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. And God was with him. When God was, is within us, I think we can do the works that he did. We can bring great healings and great deliverances when we get the power of Pentecost. So let's go on to Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, the day of Pentecost is 50 days after Easter. It's fully come now. This was a festival, a, a feast time. I believe in the uh, Old Covenant, it was called the Festival of the Weeks. So this was a big celebration. People had come from all over uh, to celebrate Pentecost. It had fully come. Next Sunday, May 31st, on the Christian calendar is Pentecost Sunday. I've been promoting this because this is going to be the great reopening of the churches that have been closed for two months. Most of them should be reopening. The president has decreed that the governors can't stop 
the reopening of the churches any longer. We'll see what happens. But let's get ready. Let's get prepared for Pentecostal Sunday. Make it a big day. It should be a big day, a massive return to church. I'm looking forward to it. Are you? When people are once again gathering together and worshiping God in spirit and truth, gathering together in one place, in one accord. And this is, this is important. I know we have the house church movement, and I'm not against that. I'm for people gathering in their houses. But I don't like it when they become anti-church buildings, so to speak. Um, then there, there's a time when as many believers as possible need to get together and worship God in spirit and in truth. They were in one place. And, you know, it's you have to have often a sizable place to get all the believers in a city <laughs> together. And, of course, you have, we're divided up into denominations today, and there's a lot of division within the church. But, you know, believers from a certain persuasion, uh, you know, some have, people have small churches, some have large churches, mega churches. Find a place to gather. We have these church buildings. Let's fill them up. God has blessed us with buildings. Let's fill these buildings up. Places to worship God in spirit and truth. Now, I had a church I founded in central Ohio. We were in operation for 15 years, and we started off meeting in our home. But that got rather old after a while, especially as the church began to grow. And so God eventually gave us a building. It's a matter of convenience. And you can do more things when you have a building than you can just when you're in someone's home. That can get restrictive after a while. So thank God for the buildings. Thank God for the wonderful cathedrals and basilicas the churches has built over the centuries. These architectural marvels. And where would we be without the church buildings as part of the scene of, of a town, part of the skyline of a town with their steeples and so on as a reminder to, of God and worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, has Pentecost fully come in your life? This is more than just a day. Pentecost is an experience. Do you have the fullness of the Holy Ghost in your life? Consistently. Are you a person filled with the Holy Ghost on a daily basis? Does it fully come in your life daily, the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit just isn't an it, just isn't a pronoun. That pronoun stands for somebody. The third person of the divine trinity dwells in you, dwells in me. If you're a true believer, we need to be filled with his spirit, to overflowing, overflowing with his spirit. Sometimes we need new fillings of the Holy Spirit. And that's what I'm praying that will happen on Pentecostal Sunday on May 31st overflowing of God's spirit as people gather and respond to altar calls and intercede for our country. I, I pray that pastors will get this vision to really promote Pentecostal Sunday, just like we promote Easter Sunday. Churches were closed on Easter Sunday. The president even regretted that. He had anticipated and hoped that they'd be open on Easter Sunday. But Pentecost, it might not be quite as significant as Easter, but it's a pretty big deal, a real big deal. Uh, many uh, church historians consider the birth of the church was really on the day of Pentecost. Well, some disagree with that position, but certainly... If it wasn't the beginning, it was a significant development, development, a significant advancement of the church of Jesus Christ on the day of Pentecost 
when believers were filled with the Holy Ghost and power. You have the power of God. Hello, David. Good morning from California, Southern California. Wonderful Southern California. Unfortunately, it's Socialist California. Very glad that you're watching too. Okay, so they were in one accord in a place, in one place. They had, they were in agreement. Now we can come into agreement as we agree to, on, on the essentials and not concentrate on the minors, but the majors of the faith, the major doctrines of the faith, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ, his incarnation, the virgin birth, the inspiration of the scriptures, the Holy Trinity. I can fellowship with anyone who loves the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe he atoned for our sins and rose again. I extend the right hand of fellowship to anybody. If you're out there and you believe that, I don't care what denominational connection you have. You may be not non-denominational or or trans-denominational or whatever, or pan-denominational. So they've been praying and fasting. And when the day had come that they were all anticipating, looking forward to, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing, mighty, or violent wind And it filled all the house in which they were sitting. This was a sign of the Holy Spirit. The wind is the sign of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus spoke to Nicodemus in John 3, he gave his message to Nicodemus in the new birth. He said, the wind bloweth where it listeth and where it pleaseth. And we hear the sound thereof. But no man knows from whence it cometh or whither it goeth. And so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. We can't explain everything about the new birth. But when there's a new birth, there's a radical change. When you turn from a self-centered to a God-centered life. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, there's power in your life. You'll know it. Filled all the house in which they were sitting. Yeah, I like that. It's mostly an old guy like me sitting. You know, we have our church pews. Why do you have to go to church and spend all this time standing up? You know, I, I know it's an honor of the Lord, and that's good. It's fine for the younger ones, but I get tired of standing up after a while. I like to be able to sit down. And I got some back issues, and uh, my back gets a little sore after standing for too long. Now, when I'm preaching, I don't notice it. But uh, because I have a greater anointing of the Holy Ghost on me when I'm doing the preaching than when I'm just listening or worshiping, I'll have to admit. So it's all right to sit down and worship. It's all right to sit down and sing hymns and psalms and spiritual songs. Okay, so the washing mighty wind, hallelujah. When Cindy and I got married here in Terre Haute, Indiana, in 1983, when we were at the alders, a great storm came outside. It was like a rushing mighty wind that moved through the whole church. You could hear the sound that dimmed the lights. It was a rather frightening experience, I'll have to say. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. No, it wasn't fire, evidently, but it was like fire. Cloven tongues like fire. And these cloven tongues fell upon each of them. 
You know, if you notice the United Methodist Church, uh, you'll see this if you look around the church, they have a symbol. Their symbol is, is the cross and a flame. I like that. So a reference to the crucifixion and a reference to Pentecost, a reference to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Makes for a good logo for, for a church or a, a denomination. It sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, all of them. And they began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So there was a supernatural manifestation. They began to speak in tongues. Now, evidently, this was no one languages because the people heard them speak in languages that at least some of them knew, speaking of the wonderful works of God. There's also ecstatic utterances that a person filled with the Holy Spirit might speak. These are unknown tongues, tongues that aren't any language known to man. So there's two types of the usage of tongues in the Bible. Well, there's more than two, really, but we're not going to get into all that. But there was the supernatural manifestation here. I don't want to argue too much over the, the tongues issue. But there will be some sort of supernatural manifestation in and through you, I believe, when you're a person filled with the Holy Ghost and power. You'll have fire. That cloven tongues like this fire sitting upon each of them John the Baptist said, the one who comes after me, he is mightier than I. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. We don't hear too much about and with fire today. Oftentimes after I'm on campus, the newspapers, student papers say, fiery preacher visits uh, such and such campus. I like that. Fiery preacher. I want to keep the fire burning. Fired up? Are you fired up? Sometimes the embers, you know, are getting low and we need to, you know, fan, fan the flames a little bit. Get fired up. We all need, I need to get fired up from time to time. That's why, well, it's a good reason to go to church, to get fired up. Not so much for the presence of the church, but then to take the gospel out to the world, out to the unbelievers. We need to get fired up to do that. It's a great battle out there. We need firepower. Hallelujah. I remember when I was filled with the Holy Ghost, shortly after I was saved, maybe it was a couple months after I was saved, I'd gone to a youth rally in Terre Haute, Indiana just a block from the house in which I grew up as a boy on South 6th Street in Terre Haute, Indiana. And it was an open lot. And each summer, they would have a tent meeting on that lot. A Pentecostal tent meeting. Everyone in the neighborhood called them the Holy Rollers. And I had to admit, we sort of laughed at the holy rollers, and I'd get on my bike, and sometimes with some of my friends, and uh, an evening, maybe, I never went, I don't remember going inside the tent and actually sitting down, but I would uh, sit on my bike outside and, and watch the holy rollers. It was interesting. I, I don't know that I uh, particularly made fun of them. I just... Thought it was interesting and uh, took in what they say. I, I wish I wanted to go on in and sat down and really listen. And I could avoid a lot of heartache and trouble in my life if I had uh, received the message and been born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. I had the opportunity. But at least I saw something that had an effect upon me later. A seed was planted 
It was just as a boy, but were, they were annually there, uh, these Pentecostal people. Well, meanwhile, I grew up and, of course, had rebelled and got involved in the drug radical revolutionary movement of the 60s. I had been a college professor and I got saved in August of 1972. You know the story, we won't go into details against that. But the pastor that led me to the Lord was an Assembly of God pastor. So he began to tell me about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Assemblies of God and the Pentecostal people very much emphasized that as a, an experience happening after you're saved. It could happen when you're saved, but usually later in, in their tradition and their experience. And so I, uh, meanwhile, in this vacant lot, they had built an Assembly of God church. And I'd only been saved a short time, so wherever there's any meeting going on, church meeting, church rally, I like to attend. And it was a youth rally. I was a pretty old youth that time. Uh, most of them were high school and younger age, I suppose, some college age. I was uh, 29 at the time. And the pastor or the guest evangelist spoke on the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And I went forward to the altars and hands were laid upon me and I was filled with the Holy Ghost and I began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. And then I believe it was on the next Sunday that I gave my first message. You've heard about that. I was um, at the altars of our church on a Sunday morning and seeking God's will, and uh, the Lord spoke to me and said, I'm going to make a way for you to preach to 5,000 people today. I said, but Lord, I've never preached before. I'd witnessed one and one, done a lot of that, and I'd given my testimony, uh, you know, to Christian groups and even in church settings, but I never really preached, and, uh, I, and the Lord said, well, if you can tell one person about me, which you've been doing a lot, you can preach. Just say the same thing you'd say to that one person. Only say it louder so everyone can hear you. Oh, well, that makes sense. That must be God. So uh, I was reminded that there was a rock and roll concert going on in my hometown, Terre Haute, Indiana, Fairbanks Park, down by the Wabash River. And it was an annual rock concert. Now, to make sure you get the picture, I'd been there the year before, hair flowing over my shoulders, a big bushy beard, nothing on but a pair of cut-off Levi's, um, a bottle of wine in one hand, a joint of marijuana in the other, doing some sort of blue dance with a bunch of hippies. But here it was, I was returning one year later, fully clothed and in my right mind, Bible in hand, no joint of marijuana, no intoxicating beverages, but a Bible and a man full of the Holy Ghost. And as I walked through this, I, I, I had a blue blazer on, a classic tie, button-down Oxford shirt, khaki pants, and penny loafers. And as I uh, walked through that crowd, people were just spread away from me. I, I suppose they maybe feared I was a narcotics agent or whatever, I don't know. But... Uh, I was taking in the scene, and there was a group playing that day called the Doobie Brothers. Of course, they weren't brothers. They weren't really brothers. And their last name was not Doobie. Doobie is street slang for a marijuana cigarette, and there was a lot of marijuana smoking going on there with the rock and roll. And the Doobie Brothers finished their 
said, but the song that they had popularized, I don't know, maybe they wrote it, I'm not sure, called Jesus is Just All Right With Me. Do any of you remember that? Morris, do, do you remember that song? Are you old enough? Jesus is Just All Right With Me. And it got a good response from, from uh, the potheads. <laughs> they liked it. And, and the Doobie Brothers left the stage, and the stage was empty, and I thought, well, this must be my cue. So I jumped up on the platform, grabbed the microphone. Again, you know, people didn't know me, who I was, or some knew me. Uh, because I was kind of a, I was a rather notorious hippie in Terrell. Some knew who I was. But others, you know, he looks official. He's got a coat and tie on, and official look about you. If you look official, you can get away with a lot, you know. And, uh, so I grabbed the microphone and, and I said, uh, now Jesus is just all right. Yeah, man, fire out. Oh, wow, he's all right. And then I said, but you are all unrighteous. And I began to preach. And suddenly got very quiet. No, oh, wows on the, you are all unrighteous. You are all wrong. You are all sinners. No amens on that one. So I preached five minutes and ran out of things to say. I was a new preacher and don't have that problem anymore, of course. And I came down from the microphone and a man, young, young man came up and shook hands with me and said, Sir, while you were preaching, I surrendered my life to Jesus. Never saw the young man afterwards. I trust I'll see him in heaven if he continued in the faith. And God showed me my ministry that day. And that Sunday night, I went to church and I gave a testimony about what I'd done. And uh, it was just a little country church in a small town in Rosedale, Indiana. And the pastor that led me to the Lord, Clyde Swalls, said, you know, listen, it's, you know, church have testimony time. And... Uh, you know, Sunday night, a lot of liberty in a service. Most churches don't have Sunday night anymore. We need another Pentecost. And after I gave my testimony, the pastor said, Pastor Swall said, you know, Jed, you could not have done that if you had not been recently filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in the Holy Ghost. And I pondered what he said. I thought, well, that's right. That's not something I would normally do. I'm, I'm basically not an outgoing type person. I don't have an outgoing natural personality like my wife Cindy. I'm rather reserved. And some people maybe think me somewhat shy. Maybe I am uh, socially. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon me, I'm another man. I'm a man filled with the Holy Ghost in power. So it makes all the difference. We need more preachers. We need more missionaries. And the key is having another Pentecost where we're endued with power from on high to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ under the uttermost part of the earth. Let's prepare for that on Sunday, Pentecostal Sunday, a new outpouring, a refreshing of the Spirit, the latter reign of the Spirit on God's people that will accomplish great and mighty things. Hallelujah. Let's pray to that effect right now. That there'll be another Pentecost. You know, that era I got saved, in the early 70s, there was a revival spirit, you know, the Jesus movement. There was a neo-Pentecostal movement, I believe. A lot of people got saved in that era. era. Uh, I know a lot of my friends who got saved in the early 70s. So we need another revival where people are getting saved. They just weren't getting saved in the churches. They were getting saved outside of the church buildings. 
See, we need to take Pentecost outside of the church buildings. Too often we've confined it to the church building. And so we, again, we appreciate the building. We don't want to come against the building. But we need to take this message outside the building. So I try to be both an insider and an outsider. Some are just outsiders. I like to preach inside as well as outside. And God has opened these doors to me. And I'd be glad to come and preach inside your church and talk about some of these things. Uh, Frank, you gather with us just about every day. Thankful to have your presence again. And that amen, amen. Can I get another amen? Hallelujah. Father, we pray that this Sunday, Lord, God's people will be determined to regather, that the preachers will be bold enough and organized enough to open up their church doors widely once again, Lord God, and that God's people might come from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south, and gather in these wonderful facilities, Lord, you've provided for the churches, whether it be a storefront building or a great cathedral, Lord God, that, that we would gather and worship you in spirit and in truth and get in one mind and one accord and, and that the Holy Spirit would promote unity above the believers, that we would love one another and, and, and do what is loving, not be so critical of one another. Pour out your spirit upon us, Lord, that we can have another Pentecost. We pray that this Sunday, another day of Pentecost will fully come, fully come. In Jesus' name, amen.